What's up, Bison Fire fans? Welcome back to the House of Vine podcast and a brand new POV breakdown. For this series, we'll be heading back to A Dance with Dragons, flipping the pages towards the end where we'll find the novel's epilogue known to the fandom as the Kevin Lannister POV. So, enough with the intro chit-chat, let's get started. I'm no traitor, the Knight of Griffin's Roost declared. I am King Tommen's man and yours. A steady drip, drip, drip punctuated his words as snow melt ran off his cloak to puddle on the floor. The snow had been falling on King's Landing most of the night. Outside, the drifts were ankle deep. So you say, sir, words are wind. Then let me prove the truth of them with my sword. The light of the torches made a fiery blaze of Ronnet Connington's long red hair and beard. Send me against my uncle, and I will bring you back his head, and the head of this false dragon, too. Lannister spearmen in crimson cloaks and lion-crested half-helms stood along the west wall of the throne room. Tyrell guards in green cloaks faced them from the opposite wall. The chill in the throne room was palpable. Though neither Queen Cersei nor Queen Marjorie was amongst them, their presence could be felt poisoning the air like ghosts at a feast. Behind the table, where the five members of the King's small council were seated, the Iron Throne crouched like some great black beast, its barbs and claws and blades half shrouded in shadow. Kevin Lannister could feel it at his back, an itch between the shoulder blades. So the epilogue begins with Sir Kevin Lannister, the newly appointed Hand of the King, Mace Tyrell, and the other small council members, Randall Tarley, Harry Swift, and Maester Pycelle, receiving Sir Ronnet Connington, Knight of Griffin's Roost. Ronnet was brought to court from Maidenpool so the small council could determine if he is helping his uncle, though he swears to be King Tommen's man. Ronnet's cloak is wet with melting snow, adding Kevin's description of the weather. This clearly tells the reader winter has finally arrived to the capital. We know that both Pycelle and Sir Kevin will be dead by the end of this chapter. It was in our first passage that Martin gave us the foreshadowing that Kevin will soon be joining his brother Tywin. In regards to the Iron Throne, Kevin says that he could feel it at his back, an itch between the shoulder blades. This itch will soon be replaced by an arrow. Next, I'd like to draw your attention to the position of the Lannister and Tyrell guards. It could be nothing, but it would seem that the siding of the guards, Lannister's on one side of the throne room, Tyrell's on the other, sort of mimics the division found within the royal fold, which are these two houses. The small council meeting scene is filled with differing opinions on how to deal with the realm's problems. Now real quick, before we move on with the chapter, I want you to keep something in mind. We all remember that it was Varys who assassinates Sir Kevin at the epilogue's end. He claims that it was a response to Kevin doing a good job bringing peace to the Seven Kingdoms. It's safe to assume he has a spy high up within the government. I believe this spy is a member of the small council. As we continue to listen, keep an ear open for hints telling us who that might be. Today, the throne was empty. He had seen no reason for Tommen to join them. Mace Tyrell was speaking. We shall deal with your uncle and his feigned boy in due time. The new king's hand was seated on an oaken throne carved in the shape of a hand. You will bide here until we are ready to march. Then you shall have the chance to prove your loyalty. Sir Kevin took no issue with that. Escort Sir Runnet back to his chambers, he said. Supposedly the swords who had landed in the south were being led by one of his own blood. Grand Maester Pycelle gave a ponderous shake of his head. His uncle once stood just where the boy was standing now and told King Harris how he would deliver him the head of Robert Baratheon. How many men-at-arms accompanied Sir Ronnet to the city? Sir Kevin asked. Twenty, said Lord Randall Tarley, and most of them Gregor Clegane's old lot. Your nephew Jamie gave them to Connington. They had not been in Maidenpool a day before one killed a man, and another was accused of rape. 
If it were up to me, I would send them all to the Night's Watch. The wall is where such scum belong. A dog takes after its master, declared Mace Tyrell. Black cloaks would suit them, I agree. A hundred of his own high garden men had been added to the gold cloaks, yet plainly his lordship meant to resist any balancing infusion of Westermen. Kevin Lannister was beginning to understand why Cersei had grown so resentful of the Tyrells. The mountain's men were always fighters, he said in a conciliatory tone, and we may have need of every sword against these cell swords. If this truly is the Golden Company, as Kyburn's whisperers insist, call them what you will, said Randall Tarley. They are still no more than adventurers, perhaps, but the longer we ignore these adventurers, the stronger they grow. We have had a map prepared. Grand Maester? Here. Pycelle pointed with a spotted hand. Here and here, all along the coast and on the islands. And now we have reports that Cunnington is moving on Storm's End. If it is John Cunnington, said Randall Tarley. Sir Kevin sends Sir Ronnet back to his chambers and pretty much places him under house arrest. There he will wait until King's Landing is ready to march south on the Stormlands. This leaves the throne room pretty much empty, save for the small council and their guards. They continue discussing what to do with Ronnet's men. Lord Randall suggests sending them to the wall, and Mace agrees. We need to keep in mind that Red Ronnet's men were once the Mountain's men, meaning they're Lannisters. Randall and Mace sending them to the wall is a way to indirectly assure there are no capable fighting Lannisters within the city walls. This gives House Tyrell the upper hand. Speaking of the Night's Watch, I want to point out that Lord Tarly's statement, the wall is where scum belong, is a little nod to how he truly feels about his firstborn son, Samwell, though we already had a pretty good idea on how he felt. Sir Kevin then makes a mental note that the gold cloaks have grown with men from the Reach, with no signs of adding any western men. This is the first time Kevin realizes how greedy Mace really is. He doesn't want to push the issue, however, due to all the Tarly bannermen who showed up to King's Landing after Queen Marjorie was arrested, plus the fact that all the good fighting men are off with Jaime in the Riverlands. The latter is probably why Sir Kevin tried to keep Sir Ronnet's men in the city. Next, let's talk about the incursions to the south. John Connington has landed troops, that of the Golden Company, all around the Stormlands and the Stepstones, and is accompanied by what Red Ronnet called a false dragon. Martin reveals in one of Dance's Tyrian chapters that this false dragon is really Rhaegar Targaryen's dead son, Aegon VI. I personally believe, like many of you out there, that young Griff, this feigned boy, is actually a Blackfire descendant, not Rhaegar's son. However, this video isn't the place to debate whether young Griff is truly Aegon or not. Moving on, Grand Maester Pycelle brings out a map showing the location of each incursion taking place in the south. Sir Kevin fears that the longer they wait to deal with these southern invaders, the stronger they'll become. Lord Randall seems to think nothing of the Golden Company, claiming that they're only adventurers. It doesn't seem like Lord Randall believes the invaders to actually be the Golden Company. We then hear Maester Pycelle mention a report that states Connington and company will soon try and take Storm's End. Again, Lord Randall immediately responds with doubt, questioning if it really is John Connington. Maybe it's just me, but it almost appears that Lord Randall is trying to slow down the throne's response to these attacks. So for the last passage in today's video, Let's continue with the epilogue and listen to Kevin and the small council talk about Queen Marjorie's trial and the exiled knight, John Connington. Storm's end. Lord Mace Tyrell grunted the words. He cannot take Storm's end. Not if he were Aegon the Conqueror. And if he does, what of it? I shall recapture it after my daughter's innocence is proved. How can you recapture it when you have never captured it to begin with? I understand, my lord, but uh, these charges against my daughter 
our filthy lies. I ask again, why must we play out this mummer's farce? Have King Tommen declare my daughter innocent, sir. Do that, and the whispers will follow Marjorie the rest of her life. No man doubts your daughter's innocence, my lord, Sir Kevin lied. But his High Holiness insists upon a trial. Lord Randall snorted. What have we become when kings and high lords must dance to the twittering of sparrows? We have foes on every hand, Lord Tarly. Defy the High Septon, and we will have blood running in the gutters of King's Landing as well. Mace Tyrell remained unmoved. Once Paxter Redwine sweeps the Iron Men from the seas, my sons will retake the shields. As for Cunnington, if it is him, Lord Randall said, as for Cunnington, what victories has he ever won that we should fear him? He could have ended Robert's rebellion at Stony Sept. He failed, just as the Golden Company has always failed. Some may rush to join them, I. The realm is well rid of such fools. Sir Kevin wished that he could share his certainty. He had known John Connington, slightly. A proud youth, the most headstrong of the gaggle of young lordlings who had gathered round Prince Rhaegar Targaryen. Arrogant, but able and energetic. That and his skill at arms was why Mad King Ares had named him Hand. Too soon, Lord Tywin Lannister had declared when word of the King's choice had reached Castle Rock. Cunnington is too young, too bold, too eager for glory. The Battle of the Bells had proved the truth of that. That was all so long ago, though. If this is indeed John Cunnington, he will be a different man. Older, harder, more seasoned, more dangerous. So it's pretty clear that Lord Mace is completely oblivious to the nightly activities of his daughter, Marjorie. He believes that all the charges brought against her are false. He asks Sir Kevin to have King Tommen pardon her, but Kevin tells him if he were to do so, everyone would assume Marjorie to be guilty. Kevin is afraid of what might happen if the Faith were to abandon Tommen's cause. He fears that if it appeared that they were defying the gods, the smaller houses and the small folk would flock to Stannis. I also believe that the problem with Queen Marjorie is distracting Mace, in turn, making him appear weak. Mace has decided not to make any moves until after the trial, which Sir Kevin thinks is a mistake. I also want you to take note that Lord Randall is disgusted that they have basically become pawns in whatever game the High Sparrow is playing. The small council gets back to the topic of John Connington, and once again, Lord Randall doubts that it is Connington, this time going as far as interrupting his liege lord to make the statement. This is when Mace starts ranting about Connington and Storm's End, and how the Golden Company will always be failures. He paints John Con as a failed battle commander, reminding the small council that he failed to capture Robert during the Battle of the Bells. I want to say... I cannot stand Mace Tyrell. He talks a big game and he thinks that he can back it up. However, his huge ego is just a result of Lord Randall's military expertise. The real power of the Reach, and maybe even King's Landing at the moment, isn't the Tyrells, but House Tarly. We need to remember that Lord Randall was the only one that defeated Robert during Robert's Rebellion. Mace Tyrell getting all the credit for things Randall accomplished might have some severe consequences later in the Ice and Fire story. Now, back to Connington, Sir Kevin's analysis of John Con is the complete opposite of how Lord May sees him. Kevin remembers Tywin saying it was too soon for Ares to make Connington hand that he was too young and prone to rash judgment. Kevin thinks that the passing of time would have made Connington a more cautious commander. If you consider that it's been about 17 years since he was exiled, adding how easily we saw him capture Griffin's Roost, Sir Kevin might be correct. Although, if we learned anything from my Melisandre Breakdown series, it's that POV characters are 9 times out of 10 wrong in their assumptions. Okay, so I'm going to end part 1 here. In part 2, 
will wrap up the small council meeting in which they'll discuss the growing reports of dragons to the east as well as finding a way to deal with the kingdom's debt crisis and the Iron Bank of Bravos. Thanks for watching. Share, like, and subscribe to stay updated and be the first to watch newly uploaded videos.